I'm the only one of the Navy contingent among our crew, and I had to tell them uh, what a wonderful place Hawaii was to be uh, on a tour of duty here. Uh, talking from the Navy point of view, I'm also glad to be part of the crew. Uh, we enjoyed our trip. We hope we contributed a lot towards our space program. It's a good program, but again, it's the people that are behind it that really uh, make it count. And uh, we appreciate our trip, and we appreciate uh, your help and cooperation in making it possible. And Colonel Anders. I again would like to thank all of you for being here to welcome us today. I'd just like to say that I was proud to be a part of something I think our country and the whole world can be proud of. And I want to thank you, the American people, for helping make it possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out. We really appreciate it. Uh, we wish we could stay around longer and enjoy your fine hospitality and weather, but uh, we still have a little work to do, and so we better get on back to Houston and get with it. Thank you. Hawaii's Governor Burns said aloha and goodbye to the astronauts. Each man had been given a box of Hawaiian fruit. Each was given some orchids to take home to his wife. That trip in a C-141, which is a military cargo jet that travels almost as fast as a commercial passenger jetliner, will take about seven hours. That will put the astronauts on the ground at Ellington Air Force Base near Houston at about 2 a.m. Central Standard Time, perhaps a little earlier if the pilot catches a strong enough tailwind. En route, Borman, Lovell, and Anders will begin the debriefing process, as it's called. They'll begin talking with Deke Slayton into a tape recorder about the mission that electrified the world, the mission of Apollo 8. When they step out of the plane at Houston, they'll be greeted, of course, by space agency officials, by some of their fellow astronauts, and by others who don't mind staying up late to catch a glimpse of America's newest heroes. On hand, too, will be the 14 persons they want most to see, their wives and children. Tomorrow, the astronauts will have a day off. Then they'll spend more time telling the experts about every detail of their flight than they spent in the spacecraft making the trip to the moon and back. Perhaps then it will be all over for Borman, Lovell, and Anders. Perhaps they'll become elder statesmen of the space age, destined never to fly again, assigned to the mundane task of assisting others in preparations for the lunar landing missions that will follow. Perhaps not. There's a suggestion abroad and the tiniest indication of a hint in what one NASA official said yesterday, that one or more members of the Apollo 8 crew will be named to fly again on Apollo 11, which is expected to be the first mission on which two of the men will actually go down to the surface of that cratered body of slate gray rock and dust. No matter, for whatever happens, their names are already written large in the history books of the space age. Their courage, their calmness, their dedication, their expertise, a living legend for all of us in this fearful, nervous, 
undisciplined age. This is Steve Rowan in New York. This has been a CBS News special report. Hawaii greets the Apollo astronauts.